Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hello. My name is Enrique. My pronouns are he, him. I work in our programming department here at Multnomah County and welcome to this online event. I am indigenous Nahua from Mexico, as well as a blend of some Spanish and English. And with that, I want to acknowledge that I'm not currently occupying any of my native homeland. Uh, Multnomah County is sited upon the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Malala, Clathlamet, Chinook, Clackamas, Squalatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations. These nations have become the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, as well as the Chinook Nation and the Cowlitz Nation in Washington State. Land acknowledgments recognize and respect the enduring relationship that indigenous people have with their traditional homelands. The effects of colonization can still be felt today, and land acknowledgments are a small uh, step down the path of repair, reconciliation, and cultural revitalization. Uh, this particular land acknowledgement was provided courtesy of Melanie Pai, Dine Tribe. Okay, a little housekeeping information. Um, let's welcome Harvest Moon, um, as well as Lori, who is going to be helping me moderate this event. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat, but stay muted while uh, Harvest, is, Harvest Moon is telling stories. We're going to use the chat for questions and the end of the event. You can also use the chat to let us know if you need something repeated or to slow up for us to slow down. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon is a master basket weaver and a storyteller. Her name means a light shining forth in the midst of darkness. She has served two terms for the Washington Commission for the Humanities as an inquiry mind speaker and has received grants from Seattle Arts Commission, uh, Bainbridge Island Arts and Humanities, Heritage Arts Council for Arts in Residency, Young Audiences, um, she has received the Peace and Friendship Award presented by Washington State Historical Society in recognition of significant contributions to the understanding of Northwest Indigenous heritage. Her interest in history and vast research has earned her the title of professional speaker and storyteller. She speaks from her heart and spirit and leaves uh, people with a different perspective of the Northwest Coastal Native Americans. So let's welcome Harvest. Thank you, thank you. Well, Claudia, this is a beautiful evening for storytelling, and I'm so privileged to have a premiere this evening. It's going to be a real, very quiet secret because the end of the legend is the big twist on the legend. My name is Harvest Moon. Like most babies, I decided to come into this world during the middle of the night. And it happened to be a night when there was a full moon. So my great grandfather knew that my name would be with the moon. He then realized that my tribe, which is the Quinault tribe, located here in the Olympic Peninsula, had just finished harvesting a large amount of salmon from the Quinault River. So my great-grandfather knew that my name would be Harvest Moon. And it was through the vision quest up into the Olympics that I learned the meaning of my name, which is a light shining forth in the midst of darkness. And upon returning from the vision quest, I received a call from the Capitol Museum and they were interested in having a native come in and speak to students and, and schools. And I was so privileged. So three decades later this is exactly what I did. Now, for the last 10 years, I had been so privileged to stay and live on Lake Quinault in the summertime and I spent my days at the Quinault Lodge. Well, it was, it didn't take very long that the tourists and the visitors that came to the lodge, um, there happened to be a few of them that um, 
They wanted their money back because it rained the whole time. And uh, there was some people that were complaining about the rain. So I did a little digging and I found this legend that originated up on Vancouver Island where it even rains more. And so doing so, I created and worked on this legend so that when I share the reason why it rains so much here in the Pacific Northwest, it gives a better perspective. Because uh, whenever the native people hear people complaining about the rain, we just smile because we know the land that you see today was not the way it was until the promise of the whale. Now, each year, the whales travel far up north to visit the great white spirit. And if you can imagine, they begin this long trek just after the mamas give birth to their baby whales or their calves. And if you can imagine, they begin this trek and as they take their children far up north, they teach them the currents, the tide, the moon, the stars, and the river. Because you see, when the young whales become an, an adult whale, there is a passage, a once in a lifetime passage where the whale will become an, an adult whale. And in doing so, this passage means that these young whales must travel solo all by themselves to visit the great white spirit. Now, without the, the, the presence of their families and groups, it was a very dangerous trek. And it was no different for this one whale named Kika. Now, Kika had been preparing for this, this trek for many years. And like most, he started this long trek during the middle of the night. But as the sun started to rise, the warm, warm sun made Kika's eyes very heavy and sleepy. Now remembering, if you don't get enough sleep, it could make you very ill. So Kika decided to swim into a small inlet and uh, take a short nap. As he entered the inlet, the nice, warm, warm, calm waters, he fell asleep quickly. Now, it's hard to say how long he'd been asleep, but when he awoke, the sun was still fresh in the air. Take a stretch his large body, and he started working his way back to sea. But as he got to the entrance of the small inlet, to no surprise, the tide had lowered, leaving a large sandbar between him and the sea. Keika started swimming throughout the inlet, looking for maybe other way out. 
but there was none. Oh, his tummy started to bubble and gurgle of hunger. And he started to partake of the small fish that were, well, in the same predicament as he. But as the days turned to weeks, those small fish had no means for such a large whale. Ribs started to show in the sides of the whale. Weakness overcame him and he closed his eyes for the last time. And as he closed his eyes, he thought, how disappointed his parents would be. My sister wouldn't care. But as his eyes closed, it wasn't long before he could hear voices. Is it voices of death calling his name so soon? With every ounce of energy, he could open one eye. And as he opened the one eye, there in the distance were three small canoes. And in each of the canoes was one man. When the men saw the eye of the whale open, they quickly dug their paddles deep, making a safe distance between them and the whale. In a weak, weak voice, Kika announced to the men, I am too hungry and too weak to do any harm unto you. With that, the men paddled closer. And as they got closer, and as they gazed onto this almost starved to death whale, they knew how he felt. You know, because back in the long, long ago, the summers, the days would get longer, the heat would start to rise, and the slightest lightning would torch fires, fires that devoured our, our longhouses, our canoes, our vegetation, and even our people, and it happened every summer. So when these men gazed onto this almost dead whale, they knew. With that, they just disappeared. Now, Kika thought, how, how rude just to balk at me and take off like that. But within a matter of an hour, each of the men came back. One canoe was full of halibut, another canoe was full of cod, and the last canoe was full of salmon. Each of the fishermen took turns and fed the whale. And as the last little fish went down, Kika thanked his new friends, for they, they could have taken and eaten him for many weeks. But one of the men announced, we have much fish now, so each day we will come and we will feed you fish. So it was. Each day they brought cod, halibut, and 
salmon. But it was this one day when the fishermen arrived, they brought their wives, their children, aunties, uncles, grandparents, everyone came and sang and danced and feasted. And as Keika finished that last fish, to no surprise, the tide had rose high enough for the freedom of the sea. Keika threw his body up into the air and smashed it against the, the ocean to let his parents know that he was alive and well. But then he stopped and he came back to the people. And with an already growing voice, Keika made his first speech. I am traveling far up north to visit the great white spirit. And because of your kindness by feeding me fish, I will ask of any wish you want, want, want. Puzzle, puzzle, puzzle on all the faces, young and old, until one little girl, shy of sorts, came forward and spoke for all. Hey, Mr. Whale, when you were stuck in the inlet, you were stuck in the inlet for a long, long time. My daddy was the one that gave you salmon. And you ate a lot of salmon. When you eat salmon like that, does it tickle when it goes down your big fat throat? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. That's not what we want to know. Wait a minute. No. What, what, what we want to know is if you know, you say you know this great white spirit, why didn't you call on the great white spirit when you were stuck in the inlet? Huh, 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 huh? Whoa, 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 said the whale. I am too far south for the great white spirit to hear my voice. So once again, I will ask of any wish you want, want, want. Well, it didn't take the kids three times to be told. They raised their hands and said, we want to stay up as late as we want. And then the men, they raised their hands and announced, we want women who could cook the salmon so it's not so <coughs> dry. And then the women, oh, the women had a meeting, a long meeting. Half the women wanted their men to go see the medicine man when they're sick. But the women that won by one bowl, we want, <clears throat> we want men who, who, who will share their feelings and their thoughts. And the men grumble, we want women who don't talk so much. Well, there were wishes upon wishes until finally a very, very old elder came forward with the powers of the talking stick. He explained, have we not forgotten the long, hot, summer days where the slightest lightning would tort fires, fires that devour our, our longhouses, our vegetation and animals. Obviously, our wish should be a, a reprieve from these long, 
summer days. Silence. Silence fell fast and hard. That's too big of a wish. We lose that wish. It's too big, too huge, too large, too big. We'll lose that wish. But the old elder had powers of his own. And so it was. The wish was a reprieve of the long, hot summer days. Keika left. And he announced, I promise I will ask the great white spirit. Well, days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months. Once again, the days started getting longer, the heat began to rise, and the slightest sounds filled through the woods. Bye. Now the people only had enough time to gather their belongings in their arms and place it in the canoes where they paddled all oh so far from shore. Then many had seen it too many times and bowed their heads. Others watched as the fires got closer and closer to the longhouse. And as our first longhouse began to burn, all of a sudden there was one drop of rain Another drop of rain and another drop of rain. The skies opened up and began to rain until every single fire was put out. The men and women danced for joy as they drank the water that gathered in the crevices of the rocks. They sang and danced until the Hardiest of hardies collapse. It was then that the old elder came forward. And this time he said, This is the promise of the whale. Oh, 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 oh. Don't get us started on that again. It rains here ever so often we, we 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 lost that wish it was too big too huge too large too big we we, we could have had women with big hearts <laughs> but we lost that wish the old elder hurt by all the words he announced this is the promise of the whale and the way that we can tell is if we raise our hands high up into the air, and if it starts to rain once again, we will know that this is the promise of the whale. Well, the people thought not much to lose, so they all started to raise their hands. And as each of them all started to raise their hands, as the last little hands reached for the sky, there was one drop of rain, another drop of rain, and another drop of rain. The skies opened up and continued to rain until the small creeks turned into streams and the streams turned into rivers as the meadows turned into lakes as ferns and moss grew before your eyes as cedars spruce alders and maples 
all reach for the sky. And it was then that the chief came forward and everyone became quiet. Since the whale kept his promise, from this day forward, whenever we carve of our totem poles, we will always, always carve a whale. So as you gaze upon all the totem poles throughout the Pacific Northwest, take a second glance and I guarantee you will see a whale. It was then that the wife of the chief came forward and announced, because our tribe was the tribe that brought the rain to the rainforest, from this day forward, our tribal song shall go like this. Only the elders get that little story. And that is why whenever my people hear people complaining about the rain, we just smile because we know the land that you see today was not the way it was until the promise of the whale. Nahashka, thank you. All right, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, on my research throughout my years of life, I happened to come across a uh, interesting little um, tidbit. Um, this is a, a very prestigious Chinook chief. Now you can tell by his forehead that he, as a baby, had a cedar Plank placed on his forehead. And not many people realize to have a plank or cedar plank placed on your forehead, it brings you very distinguished black forehead. This gentleman happens to be Charles Colty. And he helped um, with Boaz and he also helped create the Chinook jargon. Now, I also did some research and found across a, a wonderful legend. And I, it was such a beautiful legend. I had a tendency, I wanted to take the legend that Charles wrote and rewrite it so that people could understand it in this day and age. And then I realized, you know, I better not. That, that would be like taking a painting and, uh, from, you know, Picasso and changing it. So I decided I, I, I wanted to keep it the way Charles Colty was telling the legend to Mr. McNeil back in 1911 on a scow, on a scow duck on the beautiful Willapa Harbor. It took me a number of months to to work this legend out and i'm very proud that tonight is my premiere long ago many times years of an old man and before there was any white man on the world on the great river you call columbia lived a tribe of Indians. On the north bank of the Great River, they lived one day's journey from the big salt water. Oh, a big strong men, 
no lazy men and women that were brown and smooth like a seal and soft eyed like a deer. Chinook was this tribe's name, but they were not like the other Chinook Indians that loafed and waited around the salmon streams until they became small and weak. This tribe ate salmon, yes, but they were great hunters also. And he who could kill the elk or bear with a single arrow was honored by the tribe. The greatest of all these great men was this chief, A. A. Kuna. For you know that in that time, a chief was the strongest and the wisest. To this chief was born a son. And when he was yet a boy, he was so quick and strong that the tribe said, here is a son of a chief who will be a chief also when he is a man. But when the boy grew to be a young man, he was not like the other young men of the tribe. He did not join in their games, but would rather sit by the great river and think. And when the fairest maidens of the tribe passed by and smiled at him, he still looked out over the great river as a wise young man should. He was straight and tall, even as tall as his father. And he used a bow that no other man in the tribe could bear. And when the young men were running races, he could run to the end of the camp and wait there for a long time before any of the others came. But he rather sit by the great river and think. So the old men of the tribe was puzzled. When the old men were talking and saying wise things, he would say something wiser. <laughs> and, and none could answer the questions he asked. So after a while, the old men didn't didn't like him because uh, he, he made them seem foolish. One day, he made the medicine man mad at him. And the medicine man called him Colty. That is the same as you say in jargon, cultus. No good. When the young man heard this, he just laughed to the face of the medicine man and said, that is a good thing, Colty. When you call me Colty, I know I am right. <gasps> oh, <laughs> <clears throat> that made the medicine man more mad and 
he told the old men that the young man should be called culty because he's no good. The young man laughed at them also and said, I'll keep that name. I'm proud to be called culty by you. Now, when Colty went hunting, he always went alone. But the woods told him all her secrets, so he always brought game into camp. One time, he went hunting and did not come back for a long time. Twice had the moon grown big while he was gone, and the family mourned and thought he was dead. The old men of the council were <laughs> glad in their hearts that he was not there to make them seem foolish. One night, when the old men were sitting around the fire, Kalti came into the village and told of a new hunting ground he had found while he was away. He said he, tra he, said he traveled up the water that ran away from the sun until the water was no more. He crossed over the hill and found water that ran away from the sun and towards the sitting sun. This water he followed for many days until he came to a great water that reached as far as a man could see. He told of the salmon that were so thick in the streams that some of them were crowded out on the shore, and of the elk and deer that came up to smell at him to find out what he was. He told of the flocks of ducks and geese that were as many as the leaves of the trees. And when the water went down, the shore was covered with small dark lambs that were good to eat. A wonderful story he told of the new hunting ground, and the young men listened and were glad. The old men said he was a liar. The medicine man had told them the end of the world is just over that big hill. Colty only laughed at them and fathered a party of the strongest young men to go with him and see the new hunting ground. The medicine man said they must not go with Colty, but they must stay where the great spirit had put them. He said the great spirit would be mad at them if they went. But the young men listened to Colty and went with him. They were gone a long time. Three moons had come and gone when one of the party came back. He was tired and hungry. He told the tribe 
he traveled up the water that ran towards the sun till the water was no more. He camped on the big hill and as he lay in open camp that night, a great storm came up and a big cedar tree fell amongst them and killed Colty. He was a chief on the trip, so they buried him with the honors of a chief. They made a canoe out of a piece of cedar to hold him. They wrapped him in his deerskin robe and put his bow and arrows by his side. Then they put the canoe up into a spruce tree as high as they could reach. Then they went over the big hill to find the new hunting ground. They found the water that ran away from the sun, but it ran towards the rising sun instead of the sitting sun. This water they followed through a country of steep hills where there was no game. Then they turned back. One by one, they died on the way until only he was left to come back and tell the tribe that Kalti was indeed a liar and that there was no hunting ground over the big hill. Then there were long days and nights of wailing as a village of fathers and mothers mourned for their sons. The medicine man said the great spirit had punished the young men because they did not mind him. The family of Kalti was disgraced. It is well known to be a liar is the biggest disgrace to put on an Indian before the whites came and taught them that it is good to lie. The father of Colty was no more a chief. For the tribe said, we will not have a chief whose son was a liar and led our finest young men to their death with his lies. So old A. A. Kunai hung his head in shame and no more was his voice heard in the council. Colty's mother would not believe that her son had lied because he had always told her the truth. So she taught his younger brothers while they were yet children that Colty was not a liar. She told them that they must his name, and when they were men, they must go and find the hunting ground and take the shame off the family. Younger ones grew up, but they did not go find the hunting ground. 
they told the story to their children and to their children's children. And many, many years went by. Many families of children heard the story told by their grandfathers, but none went to find the hunting ground. So the family was still disgraced in the eyes of the tribe. But the time came when some of the young men of the family talked among themselves and said, we will go and find this hunting ground that the man whose name we bear told about, and we will show the tribe that we are not a family of liars. So they started out when no one saw them. They traveled up the water that ran towards the sun. They camped one night on top of the big flat hill and made their camp under a great spruce tree. As they sat around the campfire, they heard a noise in the tree above them and down through the branches fell a cedar canoe. Though it fell from a great height, it came to the ground as gently as a feather. And up out of it rose a tall young man. He threw out his deer skin robe and he said to them, Who are you? And where do you go? One of the young men answered, We are named Colty and are of the Chinook tribe. We go to find a hunting ground that was seen long ago by a man whose name we bear. Then you are my brothers. I am Colty. I am glad you have come brothers. Long have I waited for you. More times has the uh, birds came and built a nest in that tree while I waited for you. More times has the sun came back and melted the snow in my canoe while I waited for you. The tree that held me was only as high as a man could reach when I was put there. And now it's as high as an arrow can fly. But still, I waited for you. My spirit could not rest in peace in the happy hunting grounds while my family was shamed by the tribe. And I knew that sometime there would be some among you who would have enough pride in the family to come and prove to the tribe that Kalti was not a liar. I am glad you have come, brothers, and I'm glad you kept my name. Tomorrow, I will lead you to the hunting ground I found so long ago. The young men that came with me before got lost 
and followed the wrong waters, but I will show you the right way. The next day, Colty led them over the hill and down the water that ran towards the sitting sun. This water he followed for many days until they came to the great water he had told about. They stayed but a few days to see the place for they were in a hurry to get back to the village and take the shame off the family. They made baskets of cedar bark and filled them with oysters to show the tribe they had found the new hunting ground. As they were leaving the water up near the big hill, Kalti told them to break the branches off the small trees to make the trail. When they reached the big spruce tree where Colty's canoe was, he said to them, Brothers, I must leave you now. My spirit can rest in peace in the happy hunting grounds now that we have taken the disgrace off our family go back to the tribe and show them that i was not a liar and always be proud that you are named Colty, I have spoken farewell. He wrapped himself in his deerskin robe and laid down in the canoe. And in an instant, the canoe and man became as dust. So fine that the sharpest eye among them could not see a bit of it in the grass. The young men went back to the village and showed the oysters and told their story. And there was great rejoicing among the family of Kulti that they were no more disgrace. Then they invited the best and the strongest to come and live in the new hunting ground that Colty had found. The medicine man said they must not go. So the tribe was divided. But <laughs> the best and the wisest followed the Colties. They traveled up the waters, <clears throat> okay, they followed up the waters that you call Gray's River. They crossed over a big flat hill. Then they came down the waters that you call Nacelle. Many days they were on the journey for they were with their family and the trail was long and hard but finally they came to the great water that Colty had found and everything was as he had said then they knew that Colt was not a liar. And from that, that is how the Indians first came to Willapa Harbor.
the old man paused in his story and rising with a sweep of his arm took in all of the harbor and said culties have always been chiefs on Willapa Harbor, and me, I'm proud. I'm culty. I am great, great granddaughter, Stephanie Elaine Culty Nahashka. Thank you. Huh. Oh, I did it. <laughs> did you, you guys like it? it? That was great. Thank you. It took me a lot. I, I was really concerned about, you know, the whites before the white man came and before, you know, but then, I, you know, that's the way they wrote back in 1911, so. Well, it looks like we have just but a few minutes left if anybody wanted to ask some questions. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first, no, this was the second time I told this, the culty legend. Yeah, I was amazed too because because as being a culty, uh, I do come across once in a while, I get people kind of mad at me because I'm always right. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, with the plant, with the forehead, and you probably, in reality, I probably could have the, the privilege to have a, a, a ring in my nose because you know he's i think it's only two he's my great great grandfather oh thank you mr pyle i'm glad i kept it too the way the way he wrote it there's another question here from mr pyle um will you be telling the story around the bay i want to really bad I want to see it at Willapa Harbor, and then I also want to, I want to, I want to retract, I want to retract that. And to my understanding, one day's journey from the big salt water, wouldn't that be Gray's River? Or close to that area? Yeah, yeah. But I do want to retract and go back, but, um, Yes, please share the Willapa, the Willapa residents, and and uh, I would be proud and honored to to share that. All right, then. Well, if nobody has more questions, it seems like there's a lot of thanks in the chat. So I would like to say that as well. Thank you, everyone. As always stay safe and sound please we we'll get through this we will <laughs>